Anne and Peter reached out to me a couple of weeks ago uh, to talk about my use of Metrofit and the use of Metrofit within the COVID-19 outbreak. I spent 20 years in the UK where I went and studied my undergraduate at St. Mary's. I did sports rehab. And then on graduation, I worked predominantly clinically for a couple of years. And following that, got more into kind of sports performance, did a master's in performance enhancement and injury prevention, and ended up uh, lecturing um, for about 11 years, uh, nine of which were at Middlesex University, where I taught on the undergrad programs in sports rehabilitation and the master's programs in strength conditioning and sports rehabilitation and sports physio. And then I spent uh, a good few years consulting to different sports teams. And the last eight years before I left the UK, I was working as the head of physical development for Harrow School, looking at the athletic development of about 800 uh, boys at a private boarding school. Uh, So my current role is the physical performance coach for the Dutch Olympic snowboard and ski team. And I work with both the adaptive athletes and the able-bodied athletes. Uh, So currently, hence my scruffy look, we're about seven weeks into the lockdown uh, with COVID-19. So for us, it's been a little bit unfortunate that the season ended incredibly early. Um, We kind of finished up early mid-March, which meant the athletes lost a lot of time on snow um, and we missed out on a lot of competitions. Again, every other country is kind of in the same uh, predicament. um, So that's kind of where we are now. Uh, So with our program uh, on a day-to-day basis, we use a variety of different technologies. Uh, One of the main ones we use is velocity-based training. Um, So we measure the speed at which a bar moves, uh, and that allows us to forecast what training outcome that athlete is getting, be it strength, power, or a subsection of those. And the way we use that is it depends on the different athlete in the different program. Secondly, we use a lot of eccentric training, um, and we use a flywheel device for that, um, and we use uh, the K box uh, by eccentric. Um, generally, we use that to stimulate maybe the landing forces that snowboarders get uh, going off a freestyle jump and the eccentric and occlusion type effects that a skier might get in a downhill race or slalom race. Kind of secondary things that may not run on a day to day basis, we use force place analysis, looking at uh, uh, asymmetries with our athletes. And we also look at uh, jump testing to look at fatigue and predicting outcome. Uh, So we've been using Metrofit to gather our training and wellness data for approximately four years now. There was actually a wellness system in place when I came into the role. Um, It just wasn't being utilized. The feedback from the athletes and coaches were, the athletes were more that they didn't like filling it in, uh, which is kind of a standard response. Um, and it was hard to fill in and the coaches more that they didn't see why it was useful um, and they didn't like how the data was visualized. So uh, what we did was we trialed a variety of wellness and training load monitors with compliant athletes, non-compliant athletes and with the coaches. And at the end of kind of six months to a year, um, they fed back on which ones they thought were better. And we came to the conclusion that we were gonna use Metrofit primarily because the coaches liked the way the data was visualized and they found it easy to access and found it quite usable. And the athletes found the uh, web-based app pretty unintrusive, fast to fill in and kind of worked regularly pretty well for them. The the biggest uh, challenge with any wellness and training load app is getting athlete compliance, is getting people to fill it in. I think you need to, over a six to eight week period, be really on the athletes in terms of filling it in to improve compliance and get it to a point where it becomes a habit. Um, And then like any habit, if you drift away from it, it will become not a habit anymore. So uh, the time constraint is reminding the athletes to fill it in, chasing them up if they don't fill it in, doing education with them on what the benefit is and explaining to them and trying to find out what they would want to get out of using a wellness system. So it's try and find out what, why they have a problem with it and what benefit they could see from it and try and help them realize that benefit. Uh, We initially probably should have done more education on why they were doing it and what the outcome would be. That's a little bit hard to tell them, you know, in a year, this is how it could affect your program. And we did do that. Uh, But 
maybe it would be more impactful to recap on that more often. So we did quite a bit of work on the education um, and I would advise anybody to do more advice on being honest. So if somebody fills in the same number every day just because they're filling it in and they're not thinking about it, it doesn't let you get a great overall picture of them in, in the long run. And getting a better picture of how training stress affects them, lifestyle stress affects them, uh, lets you, one, have better conversations, and two, make better training adaptations that are more uh, individual to that person. So I'd definitely say education on ha- being honest and that there isn't a consequence to them filling in, hey, I had 10 to eight nights in a row. What that does do, if they are honest, is allows you either educate them on how to be a better athlete, and they can choose to do that or not, uh, or it lets you see that um, someone doesn't know that that's a problem in their performance. When you first start out with a data monitor or a wellness monitoring system, the wellness questions are pretty standard. I think most of those you can take off the shelf uh, with some limitations uh, or some customization around the sport that you're in and the athletes you're in and the people that are there. In terms of your training load data, I think you need to work quite heavily with your coaches and with the athletes to quantify what those are. We maybe gave too many options for different training types, uh, which leads to some confusion. So we've trimmed those down a little bit. Um, So I think the big thing is gather the data that you really need and maybe one or other points that are nice to have and look at that over time. If you gather a million data points, you're not gonna look at all of them. A smaller, more concise amount that you consistently gather is better than one million that you don't look at. And those points can be discussed and formulated with your performance team. Uh, so the benefits that we've had to monitoring load and uh, well-being and, and uh, health in general have been, we've started to work with athletes in terms of education in where some of them have not had good performance outcomes. And we can mine the data back and look at maybe limitations to that performance. So say with some athletes initially, we had um, a high illness uh, rate within one program. And when we look back through the data, we had poor sleep hygiene across a number of athletes. Um, and we did work on sleep hygiene, its relationship to getting sick. But the big thing with getting sick, an athlete doesn't like being sick, but it was the number of training days that they missed on snow. So we were able to show the athletes, hey, you have this many sick days, and this is how many days you're not pre- getting on snow. Um, So that allowed us to give a more contextualized feedback to them of why they were missing days and maybe why they weren't performing. And that created better buy-in with them in terms of, oh, okay, that's why I'm not skiing so well. I missed this many days and I'm I'm missing those days because I was ill and I missed those, I got ill because I wasn't sleeping well. Oh, well, sleeping more and having better quality sleep gets me more on snow and helps me train better. Um, Equally, we could show when we did a, uh, period of really good physical training and um, that the guys might have found quite tough when they went on snow the number of runs or the how difficult they found skiing it, maybe at altitude was way easier and that equated to maybe more runs per day which means more ability to learn new skills so for us one of the initial problems that we had was that the athletes didn't see that we were using metrofit and that but actually we were on a daily basis we were looking at it but we would have quite organic conversations with the athletes um, and maybe something we saw in the Metrofit would spark one of those kind of organic conversations but because we didn't mention that we had seen it on Metrofit they didn't have a value in filling it in on Metrofit so I think by saying that you have seen it uh, informs them that you are looking at it and puts a value on it Um, and equally you know it the data isn't always the number one thing it's the conversations it sparks or the more meaningful conversations that it sparks um, particularly now with some athletes tell you more digitally than they will face to face other athletes will tell you a lot face to face and you know fill in the bare minimum digitally so again so you know different people utilize how they communicate with you in a different way so i got, got asked about um, what are kind of the main issues that you see with young uh, main lifestyle issues that you see with uh, uh, young athletes today I, I don't think we see 
lifestyle issues predominantly with young athletes. I think they're across the board and they vary. The nice thing about Metrofit, if the athletes fill it in openly and honestly without a fear of retribution, is you get an insight into the stresses that they're experiencing, not just in training, but across their everyday lives. Um, one of the things I would say that you see with younger athletes is exam stress and uh, school stress are, can be pretty high. Um, and we've found that, you know, when we know that athletes are going through, going to have exams, that we are now catering for that in our periodization, that we, we take that into account as a, a physical or emotional stress. Um, and the reality is they have to do that. They're not going to miss those exams. So why try and push a big training load on somebody that is already stressed? Um, so maybe with our younger athletes, we've seen that. Uh, sleep hygiene has a massive impact on performance. Um, and not a lot of athletes really notice that to the highest level. Um, but what we've been able to do is show athletes, you know, their illness, their fatigue rate, their how quickly they're um, getting tired from training or their, their rating of a training session versus maybe other people um, through Metrofit and then show, hey, here are some of the lifestyle factors that have been affecting you and really get a bigger picture of the entire lifestyle issues that they have or life stresses that they have, not just training, the amalgamation of everything gives us a better insight into the person. Uh, so in terms of uh, how we change the programs based on the data that we see, so we've seen some athletes that perceive training sessions at a much higher intensity than somebody else. And when we've mined back the data, that athlete may be training, you know, at a higher percentage of uh, relative to body weight for those three weeks. So you then can prescribe or look at adapting the program to get more out of them or give them more recovery or do more or less training with them uh, based on the data that you see. But currently we're um, seven and a half weeks or so into uh, COVID-19 restrictions. Um, and actually the National Training Centre is, I think, gradually going to reopen with, with heavy restrictions on it in the next couple of weeks. Um, for our athletes, as I said, it's been pretty tough in that they missed a lot of time on snow um, and they also missed major competitions. But in terms of physical training, um, the key thing for us was um, when we knew that they were going to close everything down as the athletes were traveling back from uh, being on snow, we wrote six weeks of training uh, for them to do at, at, at home and tried to get them as much equipment so that the training that they were doing at home was consistent with the outcomes we would want from this phase, that we were still applying the principles of training. So we were getting overload and we were getting the adaptation that we wanted for this phase. Um, and that the system of training was really similar to what they would be doing if they were at the National Training Center. So we tried to keep a very similar rhythm to their training programs. I think one of the benefits for our athletes is, one, we have a beautiful facility in Papendal uh, with the NOC there. Um, which has all the gym equipment you can want, but our athletes spend about half the year on the road training in hotel gyms, not having equipment. So they're pretty adaptable and they're pretty comfortable with that chaotic kind of not having everything that they're used to. Um, for us though, it was good to try and build consistency in the training program and that it matched what we were. So essentially now we're just doing an extended pre-season. And at the moment, we're just in a reconditioning block and about to move into maybe a bit more anatomical adaptation, so a bit more hypertrophy with our athletes. Um, and the goal would be to facilitate the, the, the athletes who don't have enough equipment to get them more equipment during this upcoming block. So obviously, everybody normally would be in touch with their athletes on a day-to-day -day basis or within the training times that they have allotted to them uh, when we weren't in lockdown. For us, we've two kind of formal meeting moments. Uh, one day that we kind of have allotted one-on-one -on -one meeting times, um, and then one where there's kind of more of a team meetup uh, where people can drop in and out with coaches and it's a bit more social. Uh, so kind of two formal catch-ups per week. Um, but then obviously we're in contact through social media and text messages and everything else. So um, again, there, there's a, a good degree of contact there, more with the athletes that want it and less with the ones who are more independent and don't want it. Uh, so at the moment, it's, it's pretty normal for the new normal. Uh, so our, our meetings are predominantly digital. So we're not meeting in person. So we're either having uh, Zoom meetings or we're on Skype or we're FaceTiming depending on what works for, for the different programs.
I think the the for most of our athletes, they're feeling pretty good in the current situation. Most are at home. Uh, our athletes spend a huge amount of time on the road, so for most of them, it's kind of nice to have some downtime with family uh, back home in the Netherlands. Um, obviously, we don't have mountains, so they spend a considerable time away. Um, most are not too stressed out about it. I think some are struggling a little bit with not having a team to train with. Um, but again, the social interaction through digital means is still pretty high. Um, so I think most are uh, coping with it really well. Also, we're used to not having normal equipment or being on the road and having the stress of chopping and changing regularly. So I think uh, our guys are pretty adapted to that. I think the main thing that they're missing is time on snow. Uh, one of the things that at the moment that we're using Metrofit for heavily is to make sure that our training is happening. So as I said, we built our programs that mapped what we would have been doing in Papenthal during this period anyway, as best we could. And Metrofit lets us see one, the wellness and how the athletes are coping with the multitude of things that are happening at the moment. But if, we're, if we look at the physical side of things, we can see the volume of training and the intensity of training that they're doing and the breakdown of what those components are. And actually, if we compare this year versus last year and previous years around the same time, our intensities of training, the type of training that we're doing, be it we're not on snow, are pretty similar. Um, and the goal for that is that when we do go back to a, a normal training facility, that we don't see a spike in our training all of a sudden. We are trying to gradually come back in um, and that there isn't this huge upsurge. I would say at the moment, because the weather has been really good, we're probably seeing more athletes doing more stuff outside um, and more cardio um, type training that they're doing. But our physical strength training and our other types of training are still going on as they would have been scheduled if we weren't uh, in lockdown. I think that the key goal from this phase is that we maintain normality, that we maintain the training for the adaptation that we were looking for. So the outcome from this block is there, uh, that we work with our athletes in that, you know, that they're following the process and not being influenced by the one million home workouts that you're seeing online, that the programs that we're doing are specifically geared to getting the outcome that they should be getting in this block. And that when we're back into a training facility, that there isn't a massive change from what they're doing at home to what they're doing in a training facility. Um, we have tried to get most of our athletes equipment so that they're able to apply some load so that we're uh, not gonna see a spike in the level of load that they're training with when they come back. Uh, I think for me, uh, Metrofit, uh, and this obviously is not a me selling Metrofit, uh, I think whatever product you wanna use, but out of all the things I've used for monitoring our athletes and the outcomes that they've generated, I think having a good, robust wellness monitoring and training load monitor that's subjective to the athlete is probably the most important thing you can do because it gives you the totality of the experience of that athlete. Um, we're data informed and not data driven. So the data doesn't, we don't go, the computer says this, we must do that. I think that's a bad way to go with data. Again, you're dealing with humans and, and, and people's lives and everybody is different. The, the data capture just allows you to get a better picture of the totality of that person's life, have better, more meaningful conversations, and through those, work out better and more personalized solutions for those, those athletes. Um, it's not about what we think, it's about helping them achieve what they want. Um, so for me, I've gone down the route of, uh, with my coaching, is using that data and that, uh, that one system to look at the totality of my, my athlete's experience and help me and help our coaches make better, more informed decisions with the athlete. I think my advice for athletes in the current situation is to continue to trust the process with your coaches and your team um, and to try and keep normality as much as possible. You know, look at what you would be doing in your training at the moment or in previous years and try and maintain that. Speak to your coaches about your concerns um, in terms of what you're doing and don't be overly influenced by social media. I mean, there's a million and one distractions at the moment in terms of body weight programs and challenges and everything else, which are great. But ultimately, if you're trying to achieve an outcome as an athlete, work with your team in terms of how you're gonna achieve that in the current situation.
So I'd like to thank Anna and Peter for the opportunity to talk about uh, my experiences, obviously in SNC and uh, my use of uh, athlete monitoring through Metrofit. Um, and like I said, it's not. I've used a myriad of different systems, um, and I've found Metrofit to fit our program really well.